Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to be get started in about two minutes. Hello, and welcome to Advocating for You, Your Business, and Your Community. My name is Jen Earl, and I am NABO National CEO. Just last month, NABO and United We announced our partnership to educate women on how to make a positive impact and build skills that will benefit their communities and their businesses. Our partnership is all about educating and empowering women to effectively serve their local communities. Many of our NABO women business owners are servant leaders in addition to business leaders, who want to positively impact their communities through commitments to public service, such as serving on boards and commissions. This is the first educational webinar as part of our partnership with United We, and together we are excited to empower women entrepreneurs to serve in economic, social, and political spheres of power worldwide with a unique focus on local civil civic leadership. I want to thank you for taking the time today to join us and for this important conversation, and now I'll pass it over to Wendy Doyle with United We. Thank you, Jen, for the introduction and for your leadership. We are thrilled for our partnership with NABO that will empower many women um, to build upon their skills. As mentioned, my name is Wendy Doyle, and I'm the president and CEO of United We, which stands for United Women's Empowerment. Our mission is to advance all women's economic and civic leadership. And we are delighted to also welcome you here today for important professional skill development that focuses on best practices for effective advocacy efforts. I have the honor of introducing today's speaker, Joni Wickham, a nationally recognized public policy expert. Joni is the co-founder of Wickham James Strategies and Solutions, and she has a variety of public policy tools and experiences. Joni served um, recently as the chief of staff for former Kansas City Mayor Sly James for several years, changing the landscape and the impact of city's policies. 
She is also, also the author of a book called The Thin Line Between Cupcake and Bitch about navigating gender biases in politics and business. She has also worked with the American Federation of Teachers, Missouri Department of Transportation, and in the office of Missouri Secretary of State Robin Carnahan. Welcome, Joni, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Wendy. I never get uh, sick of hearing the title of that book. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk to you um, about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, and that's effective advocacy. I want to start off by um, drawing your attention to the slide on your computer screen. And this slide, I think, is really helpful to socialize the concept of leadership and how advocacy is actually a form of leadership. I can't tell you how many women over the course of my career I've talked to about running for office or maybe um, raising their hand to serve on a board of commission, and they say, I don't think of myself as a leader. I think it's really common for women not to see ourselves that way. But if you look at this diagram, you see that advocacy is a form of leadership and it can take many shapes. So in this diagram, you'll see that the area um, that's up uh, towards your ceiling uh, is all about the effort and energy needed from a leader to create change. And then over to um, the other side, you'll see engagement and the extent to which leader uh, changes attitudes and behaviors of others. And so there's three different models for what this uh, uh, advocacy framework could look like. Laissez-faire leadership, um, it may sound like it has a more negative connotation than it actually does, but this is more of a free market um, behavior type of leadership framework. And this could be if you're um, holding listening sessions or town halls to gather input from the public on how then you can take their, um, uh, you can take public opinion research and uh, transform your own policy space. And then we move to the right to transactional leadership. We saw a lot of this in COVID when elected officials were trying to get people uh, to get vaccinated. And so what they would do, sometimes you saw different nudging uh, uh, capabilities and people would try to come up with ways to get people to go ahead and get that vaccine. They weren't necessarily focused on transforming their whole viewpoint of public health. It was much more transactional than that. It was all about um, just that vaccine. And then further to the right, transformational leadership. This is where you're engaging in um, advocacy so that you can motivate and engage other people to really change their opinion. So it's very interesting what some people think effective advocacy is. Uh, I've seen different advocacy groups in my work in local government, state government, and in federal government think that sending a press release and hoping, to the, uh, hoping for the best is effective advocacy. Other people think that spewing negative comments on social media towards elected officials and policymakers is gonna get them where they wanna be. And then often I see advocacy groups just show up and ask for funding for government and entities. Um, and the truth is those activities do not equal action. And there's a, a real difference in activity and, act, and action. Uh, those activities that I just mentioned, they very rarely move the needle. So let's talk about effective advocacy strategies and what they include. They include three different things that I'm gonna detail for you today. Um, the first is a landscape analysis. The second is strategic communications. And then only after you do those two layers, do you want to engage your public officials? Let's talk about what a landscape analysis is. In a landscape analysis, you're gonna think very strategically about your public policy issue and the matter at hand. You're gonna to want to define your goal or goals if you have more than one, that's not a bad thing. And the policy levers and influence levers that need to be pulled in order to achieve it. I suggest uh, to individuals that they research the facts that support your goals, but also understand the facts that don't because that's gonna make you better able to negotiate which we're gonna to get to in a minute. Consider what you're advocating for may have a positive and negative impact. Not all individuals and not all organizations experience policy change in the same way. We all can have a different frame of reference. You're gonna to wanna to build on the positive and mitigate or eliminate the negative with regard to how your policy impacts individuals and organizations. And think about on the front end, what concessions you're prepared to make in the negotiation process if this is applicable. 
This often happens with public policy negotiations, whether you're talking about an economic issue or social issue, typically advocacy groups do not end up where they start. Strategic communications. Strategic communications is different than marketing and branding. That difference is the topic of a different webinar that we'll do on a different day. But when you're engaging in strategic communications, you're focusing on motivating and educating. And there's a lot more to communicating um, than just sending a press release. We're gonna talk a bit more about that. So when you're engaging in strategic communications, you're gonna be thinking about the difference in a grassroots audi audience and a grass tops audience. Grassroots could be the activists that live right next door to you, your neighborhood leaders, um, individuals that you meet walking down the street. Grass tops uh, stakeholders are going to be individuals who maybe are business, civic or nonprofit uh, leaders in your community. Uh, Wendy mentioned that I previously served for six years as chief of staff to Kansas City Mayor Sly James. During that time, we ran 16 elections. One of them was around an airport terminal. And this, the experience of working on that airport terminal um, advocacy was really um, fundamental to me in understanding the difference in uh, grassroots and grass tops communication. So in that campaign, we found that a winning message for uh, our grassroots audience was thinking about how a new terminal would really continue Kansas City's momentum. At that point in time, Kansas Cityans had a, a large amount of civic pride and they wanted to continue taking steps to continue that civic momentum. So we knew that that was a great message for that particular audience. And then for the Grass Tops campaign, we focused more on how building a new terminal would really continue to further the city's economic development and how it would increase options for business travelers. And we found that message really spoke to the bottom line that our business and civic leaders were pushing towards. So it's completely okay if you have different messages for different audiences. In fact, I would argue that's the most strategic route to go, particularly if your policy issue is a rather complex one. You also wanna think very strategically and deliberately about where your audience gets their information. When I first started in, in politics 22 years ago, the only way to get a story out or to get a perspective was to leave your office, walk down the street to the newspaper, uh, make an appointment to have a um, actual conversation, face-to-face -face conversation with a reporter. That is not the case these days in 2023. Uh, individuals get their information from many, many different areas. And you also want to think about who your best messengers are. So uh, we talked about how um, audiences can consume information through social media, TV, radio. Um, older individuals tend to consume their information from newspaper, uh, uh, newspapers and town halls but also understanding the best messengers to deliver uh, those messages to your strategic audiences is really important. For example, um, you'll see on this slide that sometimes the Jacksons, uh, a family who live in their neighborhood, sometimes they can be the best messengers for an elected official because they can really speak to the passion point um, around uh, the neighborhood activity and really speak to elected officials about what they're seeing on the ground in their lives every day. Other times, maybe a business owner is the most strategic messenger for the type of message that you're trying to get across to elected officials. And again, it is okay to have different messengers geared towards the, the audience that you're uh, driving towards. You also want to make sure that when you're engaging with elected officials that um, when you're asking them for funding, that that's not the first time that they're hearing from you. Uh, one of my favorite stories from our time at City Hall was when we uh, had a infrastructure bond where we were gonna spend $800 million um, over 10 years, which is a huge amount of money on infrastructure. And we had an advocacy group come to us who was uh, focused on climate change. And they, their request was $25 million over five years. This is a huge sum of money in a city budget. And they uh, wanted to start by um, spending money on milkweed. 
And at this time, I had no idea what milkweed was and the impact that milkweed had on climate change. So in communities where there's a lot of milkweed, there tends to be a lot of monarch butterflies. And so their message to us was, we need you to spend $25 million a year to ensure that we have a landscape that's safe for butterflies. And unfortunately, they hadn't done the work to explain to the elected officials in Kansas City what exactly, uh, what the connection point was between milkweed, monarch butterflies, and climate change. Well, later down the road, we learned from them that uh, communities that invest in milkweed have a higher monarch butterfly canopy, and monarch butterflies can help with the air pollution uh, in the area. And so that is how, that's the policy lever they wanted to pull in order to achieve their climate change goals. So all this made perfectly good sense once we were able to have uh, more direct and lengthy conversations. But showing up and asking for that large sum of money without that additional context was not helpful for us. You also want to think about how you communicate. There's a couple of um, organizational and communication uh, theories that I want to underpin this discussion. Emotional intelligence is so important to consider when you're communicating to any audience, whether it be grass tops or grassroots. Emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize, understand, and manage the emotions of others, which includes influencing and building trust. You might have heard this referred to as people smarts and has nothing to do with IQ. It actually has nothing to do with how smart you are. It's really your skills that you've developed um, to allow you to lead other people and manage their emotions. Active listening is extremely important for effective advocacy. Active listening is uh, more difficult for a lot of us uh, than you might think because humans are geared towards uh, listening so that they can form their response to whatever is being told. There's uh, a large amount of research that suggests that um, attorneys are actually the world's worst at um, active listening because in their profession, they're always listening to arguments in a way to come up with um, their retort to that argument. But uh, communications experts suggest that we all should be better at active listening if we're going to be effective communicators and then activists. And you'll see on the right side of your screen, um, some tips and tricks to make sure that you're being a good active listener. You're gonna wanna pay attention to what the other person is saying. And again, pay attention so that you can understand what they're saying and also maybe what they're not saying. Sometimes what people don't bring up in a conversation can really tell you a lot about what their position is. You also wanna show that you're listening, whether that be through nonverbal cues um, or by providing feedback show that you're listening to the conversation at hand. You also wanna defer judgment. Um, many of us don't realize what our facial expressions um, say when we're actually judging the um, conversation that someone may be having with us. So defer judgment so that then you can take that next step and respond appropriately. And an appropriate response uh, may differ depending on what audience and what setting that you're in. And that's okay as well. Executive presence. This is something that's very uh, important, particularly in this virtual setting where so many of us now are, part are participating more um, in the virtual space. And there's three components to executive presence. Emotional presence. That's the um, very first one we're going to talk about today. That's the ability to use your emotions to effectively guide thinking and action. So whereas emotional intelligence was managing other people's emotions, uh, this is a different component where you're going to be able to manage your own emotions, um, perhaps in a contentious uh, state of discussion. Communication presence. This is those nonverbal cues that we were talking about. Uh, there's a lot of communication research out there that tells us that when people make direct eye contact, uh, the person receiving that communication is more likely to listen to them, and they're uh, more likely to convey authority, leadership, and trust. And then physical presence. This is one that's a little bit hard to swallow, particularly for women, I think. And physical presence is the way you physically show up in a room. I'm going to give you an example of how I completely screwed this up one time when I was the mayor's chief of staff. So in spring of 2019, we decided that in order to continue that civic momentum that I spoke about, we needed to pass a universal pre-K uh, ballot initiative. And this included a lot of town halls and listening sessions. 
So I left uh, City Hall one day, six o'clock, had put in a full day's work, as I'm sure many of you do. And I was dressed in a business suit because that is what was most physically appropriate in that circumstance at City Hall. So I leave City Hall at six, six o'clock in my business suit that I had had on all day. And I go to a town hall that we had organized that was in the basement of the church. And when I walked in, I saw probably 50 different working moms. Some of them had their kids um, and they were all there seemingly ready to have this conversation with me. And after about 40 minutes of what felt like pulling teeth, I realized that I was getting nowhere with them. No one wanted to talk to me about their issues and no one wanted to um, help identify how we could move that universal pre-K ballot initiative forward. And I couldn't figure out what I had done wrong. I was driving home at a stoplight and I remember looking in my rear view mirror and it hit me. I had walked into that space with a physical presence that was not appropriate for that moment. What I wish I had done was taken the time to put on my Converse and my leggings so that I looked like all the other working moms there. And then they would have, um, I think, been more vulnerable to share their experience with me. So while it can feel um, uh, a bit negative to have to worry about your physical presence, uh, it really is important when you're talking about communicating effectively and advocating effectively. So we've gone over a lot in a short amount of time, but I definitely wanted to make sure that we saved room for your questions. Happy to address any topics on executive presence, active listening, um, and how you can effectively engage uh, with your elected officials. So I see one question. Can you give an example of good, bad, emotional presence? Yes. So we talked about physical presence. Um, another example um, that I would share, um, this was also an example um, in city government. We had one city council person who, um, unfortunately, when she got frustrated, she would stand up and storm out of the room, slam the door behind her. Um, and the uh, woman leader in me just really shuddered to see that reaction from another woman leader. Um, but it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, that is not a way any leader um, should respond to a contentious situation. And that's where emotional intelligence um, and being able to display emotional presence, managing your own emotions is really important. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Okay. Well, if there are no other um, questions, feel free to uh, drop them into the chat. Um, oh, here we go, we have another one. Can you talk more about a landscape analysis? It seems like we often spend a lot of time analyzing the situation and not actually acting. What is an appropriate balance? That's a really good question. So a landscape analysis is going to help you fully understand what is taking place in the space that you're um, wanting to act in. For example, when we were doing our um, pre-K ballot initiative, it was really important for us to understand what type of legislation that would have funded pre-K were, were taking place um, at the state level, because we didn't want to um, propose anything that was already being done, but we also didn't want to have blind spots to what was going on in the state level. So it is really important not to get into analysis uh, paralysis, um, but you do have to take the time upfront to do a thorough landscape analysis to make sure that the actions that you're taking are effective and timely and appropriate. Um, Hillary asks, do you have tips for effectively engaging elected officials when you only get a minute or two with them? This goes back to the importance of ensuring that your advocacy strategy is long-term. Um, it's completely uh, realistic to expect that if you are actually in front of an elected official that you won't have more than five minutes with them. That's why you're gonna want to lay the groundwork with their staff. You're gonna make sure that you've already educated the office as a whole to the extent that you can so that you can save the ask for the time that you have that face time with your elected official. Really good question. Um, my friend Deanne is on and she says, how do we help our team learn this skill, emotional presence 
Um, yes, it is very important. And it's something that I don't feel like you have, you ever have all the emotional presence you're ever going to need. I think it's a journey. Um, and one of the things that I think um, is, is most helpful, um, particularly for women, is to have a tribe of other leaders who can create that safe space um, for you to learn from them and the different journeys that they've taken um, and how they have already maybe um, taken on some of the issues that you're striving towards or maybe learn from their mistakes. I think that safe space is important. Any other questions? Okay. I think we have addressed all the questions in the chat. Um, if I missed one of your questions, please feel free um, to uh, reach out to a United We staffer or um, my uh, contact information is also um, in the, oh, Elle's got a, we've got another question from Elle. How do you, um, how do you do more coalition building in your state? And what's your best practices? Great question. So I think coalition building is a great way to achieve results quicker and more effectively. And this is where that landscape analysis comes in. Um, we can't make assumptions on what different organizations can bring to the table or what their goals are. So I think when you're doing coalition building, um, it's completely acceptable to cast a wide net but to understand the different roles and responsibilities that each um, a member of that coalition can play. 15 minute timer on kitchen is green. Your 15 minute timer on kitchen is Any green. Any other questions? Okay. I think we have gotten all of our questions in. At this point, I am going to kick it back over uh, to um, Wendy and Jen, and Jen to take any additional questions and to talk about a couple of upcoming opportunities that United We and NABO have. Like we have one additional question, Joni, that just popped into the chat. Thank you for flagging that. So Christina asks, what's the best way to get in front of elected officials if you're not known to them yet? That's a really good question. Um, I think you look at what their agenda might be um, and figure out how to align the different issues that you're working on with their specific agenda. Um, for example, um, when United We is working with different uh, mayors, we go across the country and figure out how that, um, how the appointments pr uh, project can be a civic engagement tool that helps them maximize their impact in their own community, of course, build um, a stronger political reputation, but also how that civic engagement tool can hone in on their agenda so that they maximize that impact. So I think you, um, to sum it up, I think you look at how there is alignment in between what you want to accomplish and uh, the areas of focus that that elected official um, is uh, focusing on. And we have another question from Hillary. Any strategies for overcoming identity politics? Good question. Um, so I think one way to avoid identity politics is uh, to make your issue as broadly applicable as possible. Um, the different uh, issues that I know NABO and United we focus on, occupational licensing, paid leave, um, entrepreneurship, um, those things transcend multiple identities. So I think focusing on how um, identity uh, or, or focusing on how those issues are broadly applicable is a good way to kind of avoid the identity politics trap. Any other questions? These are great questions. Okay. Wendy, Jen, I'm going to turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Joni, for sharing your experience and wisdom with us today. 
For those of you who are motivated and ready to take action, I invite you to stay connected with us for more opportunities and programming. Our websites and contact information are listed here. I also encourage you, you know, if you are thinking about civic participation, to learn more about United We's Appointments Project. And in 2014, we launched this first of its kind program to empower women and strengthen communities by increasing the gender representation on city boards and commission or boards and commissions at the city, county and state level. The Appointments Project is a network dedicated to convening and educating women on the importance of, of representation, also connecting women to other women and celebrating their wins. And we've dropped the information um, in the chat box. You can learn more by visiting our website. Again, I want to underscore how much we value our partnership with NABO and working closely with Jen. And this is the beginning of you know more to come. And I'll turn it now over to Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. We are super excited about this um, partnership as well. Um, so we have our second webinar coming up this summer, save the date for August 10th at 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern. Our next webinar will focus on childcare-related challenges for women and business owners and the importance of paid family leave. It's going to be a robust discussion that you will not want to miss. Um, please save the date and invite others that you know to join us. Um, and we just put the link for registration in the chat as well. So please feel free to pick that up. Um, and then also in the NABO and you weekly emails, there'll be more information about this coming up as well. And I think that that's it. Thank you all so much for being here with us. We hope to see you back in August. I um, hope you have an amazing day today. Um, and we're just super grateful for your time and commitment to um, creating leaders for a world of change. Thanks so much, everybody.